Today, I'm going to be speaking to Oliver Turnbull. Hello, Oliver. Hi, Vic. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine. Spectacular. How about you? Yeah, no good. Another long day of various things. Lots of calls, lots of meetings that mean nonsense, mean nothing, utter nonsense. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. This is going to be the, the lightest at the end of my tunnel, hopefully. Spectacular. I'd like to do that. Um, okay, so traditional first question is, what do you do? Uh, my day job uh, or uh, my uh, ex night job. Um, so I'm what you call a management consultant, which used to be making um, a lot of money out of other people's corporate misery. Uh, it's not quite uh, the same as that anymore because I, I come up from a technical group. So I'm an IT nerd and I work in uh, da data processing, artificial intelligence, et cetera, now running large problems checks for large uh, corporations um so not completely fleecing them but uh we will make a living we have enough for uh, we have enough for guitar strings and shoes um so that's what i do i'm an it nerd as you know right no that's amazing because you know guitar strings and shoes that covers most <laughs> aspects of life I'm, it's a um, blues classic T yeah absolutely <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a lyric that has if it hasn't been used it should be. Yeah, so yeah. there we go. So, okay. So, how did you get started with this thing? Because you've got another. You've got other. I was going to say strings to your bow, which is terrible. Really, as we've always said, strings. But mixing our metaphors. But how did you start off in this this interesting life that you have? You mean my 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 second life when I first came to London? Well, I know there are other aspects of your. Yeah, well, your skill set, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, well, sort, sort of. Uh, I, I'm a frustrated uh, entertainer, no, frustrated performer, really. In fact, I, I came down to London on January the 8th, 1990, so over 32 years ago, uh, and I was pursuing a, a dream of being a, a writer and comedy performer with a gentleman uh, called Robert Murray, his name was, who was a brilliant comic actor. Uh, and we'd written a couple of shows together in Leeds for the for the student. I didn't actually study in Leeds. Uh, and they'd been incredibly successful. And I had not performed before really very much. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm a natural. This is easy. Um, and it turned out that it was my writing partnership with Rob, which was the thing that made it easy because he was he was quite brilliant. He was one of those um, sort of inspirational guys who has all the ideas. I added some gags and stuff. <clears throat> We, we ended up a successful writing partnership. We came down to London and we fell out spectacularly, funnily enough. Um, he went to drama school and became, um, and it certainly wasn't all his fault, but he, he came more um, keen on uh, drama and, being, and playing Hamlet and doing the serious roles, which he could do. He was very talented, but he was, he was more like Peter Sellers. Uh, than um, Anthony Hopkins, if you, if, you, if you get my drift. And yeah, I don't yeah okay. Um, and slowly we drifted apart. But what I did do uh, is A, get a day job, which is where I continue my computer nerdery. But B, I started um, stand-up comedy on the London club circuit, which was very established by 1990. I've been going around maybe, maybe eight to 10 years. It had already been going. The comedy store started in the early 80s. Alexis Sale and Rick, um, Rick Mail and all those characters, Aid Edmondson, not that I ever met any of that generation and I just started doing open spots and writing jokes and uh, working with a friend of mine called Dean Woolley who was uh, a very well, still is one of my closest friends very funny man and, and um, this didn't help my relationship with Rob Sadie, uh because uh, me and Dean were sort of supposed to be his other writing partners um, but we got to writing stand-up material for me Dean did a bit of stand-up but didn't really enjoy it and I absolutely loved it um, it's hard work in conjunction with my day job uh, and it's actually something that I wonder if I should have pursued um, because I was quite good. I mean, I wasn't absolutely brilliant. I wasn't Peter Cook, but I, I, I could have probably made a little, well, I, I did make a side living on it, um, but I lacked ambition and I lacked um, what probably you have <laughs> is, is that determination to uh, work hard at my material. 
in fact. So I quite yeah. liked acting the goat and uh, I did a lot of improv, but you can't rely on that. You need a solid base of work, as you probably know, in music uh, to be able to be successful. So um, when I started a family with my wife, uh, I gave up and said, I like my day job, actually. Uh, this nighttime lark is bad for my health. It's, 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 you drink too much, you smoke too much, uh, you stay up late. It's incredibly stressful. And if you've got a day job as well, it all got too much. So after 10 years at the age of 35, uh, in fact, the, the night of my 35th birthday, I gave up. Uh, and uh, and my, my sort of creative uh, and, um, instincts or desires came out in other ways. Um, so I started doing a little more, more corporate hosting um, of events for the company I work for and other companies. And I still do that as well. Um, and, you know, uh, I played the guitar a little bit. And uh, Blues Camp was another creative outlet uh, run by your good self and uh, the incredible team you have. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's never come out as much as it did in my, in my 20s when I did that stand there. But I don't regret giving up and have great memories. Um, and... Uh, you know, I did what I intended to do, which was as one person with a microphone, nobody else helping you, make 200 strangers laugh and get paid for it. And I, I did that and it was wonderful. Because mm. I, I, want I want to pursue that a little bit because um, I've, you know, I've seen you sort of get up and just be the raconteur and, uh, and you're very good, I must say. Um, <laughs> very kind. <clears throat> no, no, I'm just being honest. Um, but the thing is, you know, when you when you're younger, co comedy is is just something. Particularly, I think a lot of a lot of guys just do a lot of comedy. You know, just being just being mates. Uh -huh. uh, there's there's a lot of banter, but there's a difference, isn't there, about how you get from that to the being able to, you know, craft a stand-up routine. Um, there's something else in there. It's a very interesting point. I, I, I hoped we were going to talk about this, Vic, because it's oh. fascinating. Um, in fact, if we had done any preparation whatsoever, which would have sort of... Would have done that. The spirit of the podcast, I would have said, let, let's talk about the difference between uh, the funny guy in the office or the funny woman in the office uh, yes. to actually translate that on stage because I've seen a lot of people do what they call open spots, uh, similar in music. You don't get paid, but you get stage time. And it's obviously the, the, the wacky person in the office whose friends think they're hilarious. And they get on stage and it, it's, it's a disaster. Um, they don't have any, I know stagecraft sounds a bit, a bit wanky, but it's, uh, it, it, it is a real thing. Yeah, it, it is a thing, yeah. yeah. And you teach us this at, at uh, uh, very much at Blues Camp, and it's not about being flamboyant, particularly when you're in a band, it's about having your own place and realizing you're on stage it's a show these people don't know you these people don't like you and a lot of people don't have that in fact no one has that when they first start out stand-up's a very good way of getting stage time very easily um you don't have to audition for a play you just have to turn up and say i'll do five minutes i'm paid and they go yeah whatever it's hostile tonight off you go good luck um and, and so there is a massive difference between the, the the wittiest man in the room the wittiest woman in the dinner table and someone who can actually perform on stage. But one thing I found really interesting is um, if you sit in a pub, um, one of the things, are, it's quite nice to sit in a pub on your own, um, maybe with a newspaper, a decoy newspaper, and you watch people. And you watch, it, it's often single sex groups. You see a single sex group, four, five, six, seven boys, four, five, six, seven girls. There is so much, particularly in our culture, in the British culture, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's completely a global phenomenon. They laugh. Almost incessant. It's yes. like laughter, screeching laughter. Yes. And the boys particularly are very, very harsh on the person who's doing their thing. Something had happened at work and they're describing what happened at work or an argument they'd have with their girlfriend. And if they're not getting to the point very quickly, their mate stay shit story mate, shut up, you know, this is boring. Or they say, blah, 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 blah. They take the piss out of Eddie, who's always the guy who's drunk or this guy or whatever. And we get massive laughs all the time. And there, there's so many natural comics men and women, uh, all walks of life, particularly in our culture in Britain. Absolutely, we are natural storytellers um, because we have to be to communicate and be part of a, a cohesive um, societal group, if you like. One of the ways that we communicate is to make each other laugh because it's a, it's a sort of common point of reference and understanding. And, you know, um, you know, 
men in England, it's very, very diff difficult to say, uh, Vic, you know, I really, I really like you. And I, I, you know, I care about having you in my life. It's much easier to say, Vic, you're a wanker. How are you? And yeah, absolutely. You know? That is, that is spot on. Now, there's another little question within this, because I said guys, because obviously my experience of the, the banter between guys. Now, you obviously and correctly said about the fact that, you know, you, you, know, you get, you know, the women are just as funny. But what I didn't understand, and I never really understood when you get a group of women together, there never seems to be the, well, I might be wrong here, but there never seemed to be the one person who did, who was the one who was the, the center of the humor? Oh, the funny it, one. it seemed to go maybe this is the way that I see female conversation where it spins around and there's no linear thing, it's just you know, it goes all over the place. So, when you see women out, th those it's difficult to pin who's the one who's the center of it. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. It's almost as if the boys have their roles. You have the handsome one, the funny one. Yes, the yeah, yeah, one, sort the of. Yeah. One, the stupid one, the clever yeah. one. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I've never thought of that before, but now I'm thinking about it. I wonder if there's an element of competitiveness with boys. Yes. Uh, that they need to be the best at football or darts or, it's normally, or, or, or trivia or music. Or, although music yeah. tends to be less competitive, or it's, a bit more, it's a bit more covert musical uh, competitiveness. We might come on to that. But I think you're onto something because um, when I'm in a group of my mates, particularly ones I've known for a long time, I have this desperate urge to get the biggest laughs, which is pathetic. I'm a 56 year old man, Vic, and I'm in a room in a pub and I'm trying to get the biggest laughs when really, you know, what should I be doing? I should be imparting wisdom to my friends or, or um, talking about politics. But I have this desperate competitive urge. I haven't got a competitive bone in my body for other things. But if I'm sat around a table, I, I have to make the funniest. I try so hard to make the funniest joke. It's exhausting, stupid, pointless, but it, it's, a, it's an impulse. And I'm wondering if, if women are more naturally collegiate in that they, they want to create a funny space uh, and they do that between them. And I wonder I, if- I That's what I'm sort it. of thinking. Yeah, it's possible. I'd love to get a woman's view of this, obviously, a comic would be particularly useful. It might be because, you know, this is age old, tedious, are women funny? To which the answer is yes. What's the yeah, of course they are. Absolutely yeah. absurd. Bill Burr, uh, the great American comedian, um, probably my favourite stand-up, certainly my favourite American stand-up, uh, he's interviewed by this lady who says, do you think women are funny? And he's just like, he doesn't understand the question. He's, yes. Stop asking the question and get a microphone in your hand and do your shit. Do your horse shit, he says. Uh, and, you know, set up your own goddamn comedy club. Get on with it. Of course you're from. Then he's right, of course. Um, I just wonder whether the classic scenario of uh, one person and his microphone against the audience, gladiatorial almost at times, which yes. is incredibly fulfilling. Um, I wonder if that's as what women get out of it as much as men do. I used to love destroying hecklers if I could, or, you know, turning a room that was hostile or drunk. The power that that gives you is amazing. And I'm wondering whether women don't need to feel that power so much as men. Mm -hmm. uh, I might be completely wrong. And of course, you know, if we've got a woman talking to us, that's completely wrong. The power of that is just as satisfying. Um, but there, there does seem to be a difference. Um, and traditionally, of course, stand-up has been male privilege. It's been a bit of a boys' club, and it's been a bit... I mean, I love stand-up, don't get me wrong, but it's been a bit one-dimensional as a result of that. And funnily enough, I spoke to a promoter that I used to work with 20 years ago. I just happened to be in the pub where he used to... Um, no, it still does, in the comedy club. It's called the Ball and Banana, and it is one of the best comedy clubs, not only in London, but in the UK, nay the world. I used to perform there. And he was telling me how it's changed. It's changed for the better, but it's very, it's very different in the, the, the positive... Um, the positive um, energy put into creating a balance bill, not one white middle class boy going on about his girlfriend's problems after another. It would come out to be quite funny because there's a lot of great male white middle class stand ups, but to make it more of a rounded show so you get more different perspectives. And he says that's the big change in comedy that he's seen, and that's the positive change he's seen in comedy. There's lots of negatives as well. Um, which we could go into, uh, YouTube being one of them, and, and also it being more of a factory these days of ambitious people just using the stand-up circuit as a foothold into you know, chat shows or 
game shows or um, just getting on getting on a TV series. But yeah, so that seems to be the biggest change, and it's very much a positive one. But it, it is a very interesting observation you make. I think it has some merit. We'd have to get it triangulate with other people who know what they're talking about, such as a bunch of funny women. But you do see that dominant comic force in a group of boys, whether the joke's on him or whether he's the one um you know dominating through humor it's interesting it's a it's a it's a fascinating anthropological world and the, the main point was though that the skill you see in these in these performers these these not on stage performers uh that i i try to pull out in people when i'm coaching so i do some coaching for presentation skills for work um because a lot of people are terrified of presenting um and, and one thing i do say to them is um tell me about your child or tell me about your favorite football team um, or tell me about the beautiful meals you like to cook. And they say, oh, well, no, it's great. And their eyes light up and suddenly they're performing. Suddenly they're storytelling. And I say, after they've done that for about 20 minutes, because people can go on and on about their children, their music, yeah, yeah, yeah. their family, their ambition, the travels they've done, even the job they've done, the things they've invented, the people they've met. And when you forget the fact that you're performing, you, you, you can do it naturally. So I say to them, right, that was 15 minutes of a really fascinating story about how your child overcame autism. Uh, so you can present. So we've established that. So now we've just got to work on um, how we translate that into boring work material. It works really well. And people go, oh, right, that's what you mean. Is that all those to it? And I remember standing on stage at, at the Ballon Banana, the Bedford Arms. Uh, you, you must go down there. It's a tremendous uh, atmosphere, particularly in the winter. You know, summer, summer days are a bit lean. And I remember thinking, I am in that mode. You must get this on stage with the music, Mick. Uh, um, loads of times where I was just like this is just me talking to my mates in a night where I've had a couple of beers although I wouldn't drink before going on and I'm on form and when you're on form you're on fire you sort of go up a different energy level and everything's easy uh, and I'm sure you feel this when you're on it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and a cohesive um, your bits are working everyone's bits are working and the you know the the the, the sense of um of uh, your ability is, 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 is incredible and you just can't put a foot wrong. And it's just, it's, it's getting in that mode that you are in normal life, making your friends and family or your daughter or your granddad laugh um, and translating that either into a performance or into something as simple as a you know, PowerPoint presentation at work. Uh, and it really does translate. And that, that, that's why I don't really miss stand-up, wonderful as it was. It was drunken, bad, bad for my health exhilarating but i can translate it into helping other people into not exactly turning them into performers but making them understand that the performance is within them yes yes that's that's really good <clears throat> because you know that idea of people already have the skill it's just that they don't realize they have the skill it's 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 in another place um, exactly again that, that that's exactly the same with with music, as in, in my opinion, you know, whatever people bring to a situation is what they've got to offer, and that that could be like two, three chords. It could be a little riff or something, but they're bringing that thing, and you can then build things around that. And of course, when people come from their selves, there's a different. I don't want to use the word energy, but you know what I'm saying because you, you're saying a similar thing about when you're on fire. Um, it, it doesn't seem, it just is, well, what they call a flow state or whatever, you know. And, and I think one of the problems with people is they try to be something other than what they are. I don't know whether that's something that you... There's a, yeah, there's a lot of, all these expressions like the, the, the flow and the zone, I mean, it's, it's just our inadequacy of language that makes it sometimes yes. kind of a bit pretentious. Because um, there yes. are words to describe this that come from... No. Asking, Sanskrit. <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's <laughs> amazing Egyptian comic could ever be the word to describe being in the zone. And it got translated down through Sanskrit and Hebrew, and I've absolutely no idea about linguistics. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you, you're, you're right. And there is there's, there's two things that they talk about. One is your voice as a comedian, uh, and the other is authenticity. Um, and this is not character comedians, because that's obviously something different. And I remember my voice developed because it was very cool to be a bit political uh, in the early 90s. It was just the other side of um, Ben Elton. Uh, and so I, I, I tried to make some 
jokes about that. It just didn't, it wasn't me. It just wasn't me. I wasn't an angry young man. Quite the opposite. I was a silly, happy, go lucky kind of funny chap, self deprecating and cheeky. I mean, that was the main thing. So I'd be utterly rude to the biggest, toughest looking guy in the room. It always works because you do that, you know, from a beta male perspective. And generally, no one really takes a piss out of the tough guy and you normally get away with it. Not always. If they're stupid as well, then you're in trouble. But you can, you can take, tell that as a bloke. So there was this thing about, yeah, finding your voice. So what kind of comic are you? Are you angry, political? Are you completely self deprecating? Are you going to be a character comic? Are you going to tell jokes? Are you going to be a shocking comedian, Jimmy Carr type? Um, or, yeah, are you going to be uh, the lad in the office cubicle next door, please like me type, which is sort of what I lighted on. So that was that was me being me. And then the other thing is, uh, is um, your authenticity. You can't really fake that. So I couldn't really fake being a Jack the Lad, for example. I couldn't really fake being anything other than I was, unless, again, you play a character, which I could possibly have uh, possibly got a, away with it. But, yeah, once you find... And it's not you talking, right? It's not your everyday you. It's, it's turned up a bit. It's turned up to 11 to use the uh, age old spinal tap. So it was me performing, but it was us, a heightened version of me. So more energetic, more manic, more cheeky, more um, up and down, uh, but, but still fundamentally me underneath it. So yeah, when you're saying you've got to play you, it sort of plays back to what we were saying before about the performer that is within you. But the performer that's within you, you must use that style when you're when you're actually doing it so yeah i'd agree with you completely on that mm -hmm. so okay see so you this this get to that point where you know you're at school or whatever and you realize that you're making people laugh and then you think oh i could write a play or write a comedy so what gave you that idea is it because you knew somebody that sort of went you know Let's do that together or? Yeah, exactly that. So I remember distinctly, I was uh, an early teenager at the advent of Not The Nine O'Clock News and Rowan Atkinson, who was and still is uh, my, my comedy hero. I'd say probably Bill Burr, Rowan Atkinson and Amy Poehler out of Parks and Recreations are my comedy heroes at the moment. And they won't, well, Rowan Atkinson doesn't change very much as a comedy hero. And I realized that not everybody could do voices and could recount sketches. I assumed everybody could because me and my sister would do it after not the live point news. Then I would recount those sketches in class and get a laugh. And I w w did very much want to be part of the, uh, not the cool set, but the naughty set, if you like. The, the naughty boys who sat at the back. And this was my free ticket in there because um, I wasn't particularly, um, uh, you know, one of the guys who fought or was particularly aggressive or um, cool, but I could do this thing. And they could also utilize it very effectively in winding up the teachers, which um, I still do in, in the sense if someone comes up to me with uh, um, um, assumed authority over me, I, I take it very badly and I still do. Like a guy told me to stop my riding my scooter the other day and I just stopped and just had a row with him, not in any aggressive, violent way, but in a, you cannot teach me what to do. You're not my teacher, you're not my dad kind of way. So that was kind of ir irreverence, poking fun at authority, which went down brilliantly at at uh, my all boys school in Bradford. And, uh, but no, I never thought of doing anything with it until I went on holiday once. And again, I was um, pathetically trying to be the funniest um, and succeeding in some ways. And my friend, uh, Danny said, you should be Rob Murray. And, and Rob Murray was the, was the guy who was writing this show uh, because he's brilliant. And I said, fine, and, and you, 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 you're quite funny. And I said, it was very kind. And um, it was this kind of alchemy. It was, it was, my, it was like uh, um, Lennon and McCartney. Uh, not, not, to, uh, not to slightly overblow it, but uh, <laughs> we sat in the Leeds University uh, extension and he told me what this pantomime was gonna be about, who the characters were and how the staging would work. Um, and uh, could you I would go and write a few gags? He was quite a serious bloke, actually, Rob. And I say was because he's sadly not no longer with us. Um, and um, I know it was it was a period of seven weeks between meeting him and the first night, and it was like a two and a half hour show filled with gags and songs, and we did it. And uh, obviously, I'm joking about Lennon and McCartney, but it was just like the, what we produced was so much better than either of us could have done separately and then put it together. He was just brilliant at characterization and plot. And somehow I stuck it all together. And I still don't know to this day how I did that. It was miraculous. 
um, I just put, you might feel the same when you when you write a song. I just would write and write and write and it would just spew out of me. Um, I'm going to compare myself to Mozart now. So. Very much like Mozart when he wrote his first concerto at the age of four. I didn't, and it was, um, uh, no, but it, it, I just, I've never had it since. I've never had this feeling of just creativity, sheets and sheets and reams and reams of A4, even before I went to work because I had a day job then, rehearsal in the evenings and everyone going, oh, this is great, putting on a show. It was probably my most creative time. And such a shame that we fell out, um, actually, because, you know, we could have worked together again with Dean, who was the other uh, th third part of that. Uh, who knows? We, that, 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 then that's when I thought I could have done it professionally. And we had sort of people coming to see the show who would go, oh, right, we're quite interested in working with you. And it looked like something might take off. And it was the reason I came to London. Uh, again, not massively regretting it because me and Rob fell out. And I just don't have that drive to do the hard slog of writing material unless I've got a deadline. Um, I just admire these people who create these comps, uh, like the guys who created Peep Show. Uh, and the guys who created the in-betweeners and the lady who created um, Dairy Girls. I just think, you know, the discipline you have to have an idea and write out those six episodes and have it, all the characters interacting. I kind of know how hard it is. And I just yeah. my admiration for them is incredible because it's such, such hard work writing comedy. Yes, yes. Um, because it's, it's, it's difficult just putting a story together, isn't it? And, and characterization and everything. And then if you, that extra layer of humor on top of all that, it's, you know, I, I, I well, you probably know I've been writing a book. It's take, been taking me ages and ages. And I, I, it's so difficult. I find it really difficult to do. Um, so yeah, the discipline, the focus of where all this stuff yeah. is going. Um, that's yeah. just incredible. Just amazing. I used to run into Harry Hill. So Harry Hill, um, or Matthew, to give me his proper name, uh, we started pretty much the same time doing open spots. Uh, he was always going to get there. He was always great. He's ex-medic. I don't know whether he ever practiced. I think he practiced as a junior doctor or something. And I used to run into him. Very unlike his um, television persona. Lovely man. Extremely witty. Very funny. Um, but he had it all. So he had the performance. He was a, you know, he could do that act. So that, that act of Harry Hill is not, it's not him. It's a very, very, very hyper, hyper version of him. He's actually quite thoughtful and, and quite almost introverted, actually. But you could see not only did he have the performance, he had the ambition and he had the discipline. And if you don't have all three, it's, 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 it's not going to happen, which is why I don't feel bitter at all. At not one grain. I just didn't have those other two attributes to my... And also, I wouldn't really be one for me stand-up comedy at the age of 56 when I really would rather be watching Derry Girls with my daughter. It, it's it's not a career uh, really really for me. But yeah, you just you just definitely needed those three things and it was obvious that he and a few of the others that I met uh, and now see doing really well and it's really fun. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's great to see. I had one, a guy called Paul Tonkinson, very good comic. He was on The Big Breakfast for a while and he phoned me up. We had a chat because he wants to give it all up and get a day job. And he said, you managed it, why can't I do it? And I was, you know, talked, talked him through what the pros and cons were, and then pointed out that I did it 25 years ago. <laughs> um, well, 20 years ago, actually. Um, but it was, good, it was a good chat. He'd had the similar sort of thing. He'd got to where he'd want to be. He'd supported Michael McIntyre for years, and he just wanted to try something else. And because he'd done it for so long, he was kind of wondering what it's like. So he wanted to mm. chat. So moving from professional performer to, to doing something mm. else. Um, but I still, I still think he's geeking. He's, he's too good to give up, really, Paul. Lovely, uh, lovely man as well. Um, I forgot what the question was, actually, Vic, on that one. Yeah, yeah so did I, but it doesn't matter. Uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll just feed you the lines. Um, so, so okay, this this transition where, well, it's not really a transition, but you know what I mean? You're saying about training people and one of you. And, of course, that, is, that skill of communication is obviously transferable into this because you can, there's a, a way of disarming people, isn't there, with humour? Or, well, mm. can be. It could be, it could be the opposite, but, you know, yeah. when, you're, when you're dealing with people, um, you can put people at, at ease if, if, you know, you can, you can be sort of humorous about things. Or so, you know, because, as I said, that sort of raconteur way of being able to, Take something and talk talk your way through it and 
Mm. You know, it's not just delivering a game, is it? Is it? Yeah, it's a massively double-edged sword in business. I mean, one, one thing that I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to see both perspectives of are the seriousness of business or the serious way people take it. And of course, sometimes it is serious. Um, to, together with the almost the extreme of stand-up comedy, which is the, the essence of, of, of not being serious, and it's high energy and it's irreverent and it's it's the humour is everything. And you, it's certainly uh, it's a it's a useful tool. I found it very useful in terms of getting to know people when I'm on a job. So we'll we'll do projects, we'll sell work, but we'll do projects, and they can last. In my case, anything from one day to three years. And I found that one of the really um, powerful things to do is to get to know as many people as you can very quickly. Humor is a brilliant way of doing that because most people like a bit of a laugh. Um, if you ask everybody, you know, what their sense of humor was like from zero to 10, you'd never get anyone say less than five. So it would be statistically, uh, statistically irrelevant, but you have to be very, very careful with it. And I've fallen foul a few times. A lot of people think business is very serious and they take it very serious and their jobs are very serious and a gag can fall horribly flat. A couple of times I walked into a meeting, sort of opened it up in front of very senior people with, you know, some, some um, musings about the weather or something or, or, or my favourite football team. And they've gone, yes, shall we get on? <laughs> it, it just makes you go, uh, <coughs> yes, well, uh, you have a complete overhaul of your digital strategy. Ah, he's now talking my language. Um, I'm working. With, I'm working in Thailand at the moment. I'm not working in Thailand. I haven't travelled there. I will do. And um, Thai people don't really turn their cameras on very much. So, and I've been working with these people for two years. So you get quite close to people generally, even if you're only working on Zoom. And pretty much every single gag I've ever tried to make. This is basic stuff. This is 101. Um, uh, you know, wow! It's very hot today for an Englishman. Kind of, kind of joke. There's no punchlines here. These are these are one-liners. These are uh, yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you get much... Silence, and you just get this humiliating buzz or whatever that Zoom or Teams, and then you get, uh, yes, it's hot or something from these poor guys who don't understand. Uh, they're not being unpleasant. They just <laughs> that connection doesn't work. So the culture of proprietaries. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, people who take themselves very seriously. So you've got to be careful, really. In the end I was on a Zoom call recently, um, and we were talking to this lady called Siri, and she's <laughs> a, um, a diversity and inclusion expert, world expert. She's quite brilliant, and um, she's a very well presented, typical um, sort of East Coast American business lady. You know, she talks like that, and she talks very professionally. Oh, that's a real good point there, Brett. Uh, and this Italian guy came on um, who's doing some marketing in Italy, and we were going to use Siri an attractive, right? that's relevant to this story, East Coast, highly serious, highly respected businessman, and this 65-year-old unreconstructed Italian, who said, Siri, I have to say to you one thing, this podcast, this webinar is going to be a huge success with your beautiful face on the webinar. And it was like, that went down like a sack of sick, because she's like diversity and inclusion, clearly a female, clearly a feminist, and this old geezer from Italy is telling that it's all going to work. And she, he, he thinks he's being charming by saying basically how hot she is. Uh, and our head of HR was on the call. Her camera went off. Our head of marketing, his camera went off. And I was left in an awkward three-way with whatever his name was, Francesco Idioto. And this really, really rather impressive woman, Siri, who actually was great about it. She she was she didn't get offended. She didn't make a complaint. Um, I, I, I really thought she would. I mean, I, I almost did. It's just such an absurd thing to say. It would have been an absurd thing thirty years ago. Uh, but now, to a diversity and inclusion lady, that's her main thing in this call, not her looks. Okay, do you get it, Francesco? Uh, so yeah, caution with humour, but a great tool for obviously binding people. And in my yeah, yeah. line of work, uh, making those connections where it's a bit beyond a business connection. So it's a, mm. I, I actually quite like this geezer, and I would therefore like to do work with him. Um, obviously, you've got to do good work as well, but it, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, cultural differences, and, and obviously things are a bit of a minefield now. You're saying um, some of the things that you would have said 10 years ago that yeah. nowadays are... Yeah, I mean... Difficult to navigate in many ways. Yeah, and, and for white middle-class, middle-aged men, 
that I fall into the perfect category of being a non-minority. And, and I know it. I don't get hassle off anybody, really, normally. I walk down the street. The only time, you know, when I was a young man, you might get hassle off another group of young men. So who fuck you looking at? Kind of thing. Yeah. Don't get that now, because I'm obviously yeah. an old geezer who doesn't fight. Not that I did when I was, when I was that age. And it, it, it sort of puts you on your guard. But I said to Siri, actually, funnily enough, you know, this webinar that we're doing, it shouldn't be hosted by me. I'm about as undiverse as you can get. I'm right in the center of the Venn diagram. And she said, well, yeah, but you're the kind of guys who've got to understand this shit. Because if you don't, <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And she was very kind. She was saying, you know, if you say something wrong, what are you supposed to say? She says, well, most people will just accept it. You know, if you, if you um, address them with the wrong pronoun or uh, what, what the pronoun that they, they, they'd rather you didn't use, generally speaking, you've just got to say, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't realize and then move on. Otherwise, you shy away if you're a white middle class male. You shy away, you know, I'm not going to get involved in this. I'm not going to get involved in the transgender debate or anything. I just want to hide away and not get into trouble and get loads of tweets aimed at me and I'll just get on with my job. But it's, which isn't great either. You've got, to, you've got to embrace that, work out which is ridiculous <laughs> and work out which is the, the bits that um, are, you know, are protecting vulnerable people from, from, from things that have always affected people in the minority. Slightly off topic, but it's, it's something else I'm doing at work in the communication space, which is kind of well-being and diversity and inclusion. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, one of the things that you do as a white middle class male uh, is you feel comfortable a lot of the time, particularly in business meetings. So I haven't felt uncomfortable in a business meeting since I was a lot younger and therefore scared I'd say the wrong thing, say a joke that the CEO goes, Shall we get on now, please? Um, or something like that. Don't worry about that at all anymore. And what Siri said to me is just look around the room and see who the people there who maybe not feel as comfortable as you do. Maybe a uh, young woman sitting there, uh, someone from a different country, different race, potentially disabled person, whatever it is, who might not you know, feel as comfortable as you. And, and how, do you, how do you include that person? And just even that little thing of being conscious about our, I don't like to say privilege, because privilege makes it sound like we don't have to work hard to get good things happening to us. But you know, the, the fact that we don't tend to get hassled in our demographic group, just have a look around the room. And because there's such a temptation uh, to go when there's a group predominantly male, and you know one of them's a Chelsea supporter, to bring up the Spurs Chelsea <laughs> the, uh, the weekend because it's funny and that bonds you two together but it, it, it excludes a lot of other people and yeah. may or may not be men and women and I, um, that, that exercise itself has really helped me um, and, and I just think oh yeah I am really comfortable in this meeting and I'm comfortable in most meetings I bet that person over there who's just graduated a recent graduate I bet they're not let's see if we can do something to make them more comfortable um, so yeah, so that's another uh, another thing I'm getting involved with, which I'm really enjoying. Because again, there's communication element to it as well, which, I, mm. which, I, which, as you might imagine, is a natural show off. Um, I love it. Yes. Now you've got some podcasts. Haven't you? Oh yes, this is the first time I've been a guest. God, it's really easy being a guest. Yes, I know. I know. Well, this, I, try, I, try, I try to be inclusive. Um, <laughs> so, so. Again, this is another sort of, de well, development. Maybe not a development, but you know what I mean? That's another, another sort of area which is interesting to sort of see. How did you make that connection to do podcasting? Because you don't just do one, do you? I actually do three. One of them is a work-related one. Um, well, three podcasts, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, um, yeah, I'm doing... Actually, I am doing all three in parallel at the moment. The one I started um, on mental health. Um, I, 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 I mean, I came quite late to the podcast um, genre, probably about mid-2019. And I've got a friend called Paul Keedwell, who's a psychiatrist. I've known him for 35 years. We've always had a laugh together. And we're both competitive in trying to be the funniest, very funny bloke. But he's also a psychiatrist. And I've been very interested in mental health for years. I was, I, I suffered from anxiety, a bit of depression, I think, really, in my early 20s when I was doing a, a lot of stuff. I think it was probably an extension of exhaustion. And I was an anxious child until I found that I could make the, my friends laugh <laughs> by taking the piss out of the teachers. So I was always been interested in mental health and he's always been interested in doing a radio show. And I always thought that was a bit too ambitious because we love our music as well. So sort of, we had this idea of a Radio 6 kind of, kind of thing. And I thought, no. And then podcasts came along. I started listening to them and thought, this is it. This is our medium. 
because it doesn't have to be really slick. You don't really need to produce it, you produce it yourself. Uh, actually, he does most of the editing, ironically. And I'm really interested in mental health. We've got a, um, a way of getting on. Um, we've got the, uh, the, the banter sorted out, if you like. We've, we've already got a relationship, which people will find it easy to listen to. So we, we laid down a few tracks and we were completely blind. And uh, I don't know what your journey was in the world of podcasts, uh, Vic, but ours was a bit sort of clumsy. We got the equipment wrong, our mic levels were too high, the mix was all wrong. But eventually we got it about right. Um, it's called Why the Long Face? And it's slightly irreverent and humorous because I think mental health is a horrible, horrible thing, particularly when it comes to the effect it has on young people, not just young people, but young people particularly because of all the pressures we put on them and they put on each other through social yeah. media, et cetera. And we do episodes on social media, young people, women, men, um, people from other cultures. Uh, and so my, my uh, I thought if I just get, you know, one person to listen to this and go, I actually had a laugh and it helped my state of mind. And we get emails from people. I get emails from people I've never met, a guy from Colombia, a guy from Canada. Um, I just want to say, I came across your podcast. I don't know how I found it, but I was feeling pretty low and it really helped me have a laugh and, and made me reassess my state of mind. And it's just like, don't want to get paid for this. That was awesome. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, do you know what? I spent time with Paul as well. He's, he's quite a good company. So we record a, uh, a, an episode or two and then uh, go for a drink and just have a lovely evening. It's a really nice way of um, yeah. spending time. Uh, yeah, being yeah. Creative. Um, and then similarly, I have another friend called Richard Lane, who um, I lived with when I first came to London with Dean, the other chap I mentioned, and he lost his sight. And we didn't want to do a podcast on him losing his sight because that's, He's not a blind man. He's Richard, who happens to be blind, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, but he has recently very heavily got into wine, not in the alcoholic sense, but in the teaching sense. So he's got his level three diploma from WSET, uh, and he's now teaching people how to appreciate wine. Um, don't ask him, by the way, if his taste has improved since he went blind. That always annoys him for some reason. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, um, the answer is no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, he, he does say he can sometimes see the heaviness in a wine, which is quite interesting. Again, mm -hmm. use of language, uh, uh, the, the, the way you describe taste, our language is not quite adequate as well, just like it was in the other things we talked about. And um, so we did something called the wine list, because I quite like drinking wine, but I don't understand anything about it. My, my idea there was a lot of guys like me and women who look at a wine list and go, oh, Christ, let's just go for the Sauvignon Blanc, and the Sauvignon Blanc, because I know what that is, or Pinot Grigio, because I can pronounce it. Uh, and so it's unraveling that, uh, that snobbery. Uh, no, no, not, not the snobbery, sorry, the mystery, I should say, uh, of wine with Richard, who is an absolute brilliant communicator. He's just an absolute natural. And then the one I do for work is about media. So I work with the head of media consulting at uh, the consulting firm I work for, and um, one of her colleagues who's a media commentator and we just discuss the topics of the day but being a guest is much easier i've just discovered that big golly we just sort of wait for the questions to be asked and then you offer yeah no it's amazing isn't it yeah i think it actually helps if you've done podcasting being on a podcast because you know you know how it goes and um, and you know how you know and that sort of make it does sort of make a difference yeah uh, you, you know um, because I, I if I'd not, this is difficult because I, I, I know you, but if I didn't know you and I interviewed somebody earlier who I've only met once, so I don't, I don't really know him, but it, it doesn't take long to get the, the essence of somebody's character, I think, right? I don't know. You know, I, 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 I think I can sort of read people reasonably well. Um, and I would have said that if I'd not, never met you before, it's obvious that you had a skill in communication because of the way that you can, you can talk about a subject. <clears throat> and maybe that, you know, in the back of my mind, I'd be thinking, well, you do something, probably podcasting or something like that, you know. Yeah, I uh, yeah, it's, that, it's a good point about judging character. I wonder if the fact that we've both spent a lot of time on stage, you far more than me, and you sort of can get the vibe of an audience helps helps with that. Certainly, we interview people um, uh, in both the 
wine list and in Why the Long Face. And you're right, actually. M most people who accept the invitation to be on a podcast want to be a communicator or are already. Well, that's true. That is uh, true. So there's a bit of self-selection. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, your people's sort of broadcasting style are probably slightly different from their personal style. So some of the people we've known for years, but most yeah. of them we hadn't or knew peripherally. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were all great, actually. I mean, we got better at getting the best out of people, I think, because it was me and Paul interviewing them. So I was the sort of main presenter because Paul was the expert because uh, he's a psychiatrist and ditto in the wine list. Richard is the expert and I'm the host and mm, my, my part is to be the numpty as well. It's what's quite interesting when you do your solo, but it's, it's what parts you play. And um, we discovered this quite early on. You can't just go in and just start recording. You've got to sort of work out some parameters which was, you know, what, what your roles are. And with me and Paul, we both sort of piled in with jokes. And I was like, I had to say to him, well, actually, we can do the jokes, but you've got to be introduced as the expert, which sets you up so that the listener can understand what the hell's going on, what this podcast is about. It's not just two blokes um, having a laugh about psychiatry and mental illness. It's about two old friends, one of whom is a psychiatrist, and the, one of the old friends is trying to find out about mental health through his expert mate, and they're going to have a laugh at the same time. And once we've got that kind of dynamic established, again, it sounds like it would be unnecessary to over, overthinking it, but it's not. You need to have something. Otherwise, it's just a chat between mm. two, two or, or Yeah, so that's interesting, that, because, you know, the idea of this podcast about, about, about creativity is not, you know, when I create something, I do this and then I do that. It's, it's this sort of thing that sits underneath uh, creative people, the way they see things, how they see the world, and how they, how they, they function in the world, and, and how early on those elements are clear in their life. Because this is, you know, this is uh, um, an interesting sort of, you know, you get this sort of narrative arc, if you like. And it starts sort of very, very early. I know you, you were saying about uh, because you felt maybe anxious when you were younger and, and the, the ability to make people laugh was the way that you got around, you know, that sort of thing or you dealt with you know, yeah. the world, you know. Um, and again, because I was quite humorous at school. I was, yeah. you know, I had a lot of, gags and, and stuff and, and I was able to you know somebody who was the maybe the 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 bully was a, I was able to poke fun at the guy like you like you were saying about picking on the guy, the big guy in the audience I was able to do that without him realizing that I was taking a piss out of it but everybody else would realize that and they would think, you know because you just made comments that were you know, not directed at him, but mm. almost like pointing them at yourself, but it's actually indirectly pointing at them. And, and I think that's what happens for a lot of comedians, maybe, that it's a way of dealing with, you know, not being beaten up. Or, or... Yeah, I certainly never got hassled from bullies because I was on the side of the naughty boys. And the, the, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, there wasn't desperate bully at my school but there were it wasn't a rough school but it, it was an all boys school and there's a lot of testosterone floating around yeah yeah and, and it's definitely a hierarchy isn't it oh in that's it yeah, totally. yes exactly <coughs> there's this wonderful scene in porridge you just reminded me of when uh gobba inadvertently gets messed up with the hardest guy in the wing and uh ronnie barker goes and tells a joke at his expense and deflects the whole situation gets gobba out of it it's a beautiful scene brilliantly acted by um, by, all, by Ronnie Barker and all of them. It's, uh, it's, it's exactly that. And so, yeah, no, I, I, I never got... It, it's funny, I mean, a lot of analysis has been done about com comedians and, and creative people. Um, it, to me, it was a tool that helped me get accepted, and it's a tool now that helps me make friends or even enjoy work a little bit more. So I'm not sure about what, 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 what any sort of psychological uh, defect it was trying to fix, which I'm sure there are many. Um, the, I think the one thing that I just remember is the joy of it. The, it it's, not, it's not even yes. the joy of control, but I think, part, I think that's part of it. 
I really do. And maybe that's, again, the difference between men and women. Maybe men have more of an urge to control. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't want to comment on it because I'm not qualified. But to be able to make someone laugh and keep a straight face, particularly doing something like Rowan Atkinson. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very little, but so brilliant. People crack up. The power and the joy of that was what drove me mostly. Um, yeah. And I think it just helped get me accepted into the naughty, into the naughty boys. Uh, and also, I, I guess I've got an instinct for being a little bit naughty and cheeky because I, I just hate authority, particularly assumed authority. I respect yeah. a police officer because he or she has trained for years to be a police officer. Someone telling me not to do something in the street can really go and themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there's been a lot of analysis about that. And, you know, the, the, obviously the classic, the classic um, uh, case of the, of the sort of um, uh, Tears of the Clown, the kind of uh, yeah. um, Tony Hancock uh, kind, yeah. of, kind of thing. I, I, I met a lot of comedians in the 10 years I was on the circuit and I found like anything, like a lot of policemen, like a lot of guitarists, like a lot of uh, plumbers, like a lot of chimney sweeps. It's the gamut of people from miserable to jolly, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Characteristics. Um, um, but, but you get introverts, you get extroverts, you get insecure people you get very stable people uh and, and you'll find that with musicians you know people have one idea of what a musician looks like slightly sort of uh you know i don't know to be laid back druggy whatever you think of musicians and of course you'll know that you get all gamut of uh of people who have to be musicians as well um but i mean it is it is fascinating the whole, the whole thing about laughing is a ridiculous thing isn't it it's yeah. a ridiculous thing to do why would you do that thing that I'm doing now uh, to express joy in something I'm thinking at the moment. It just doesn't make any sense. You don't, you, would laughs don't need to laugh, they, they get all right. Mice don't, don't know. Laugh. They might do, they might do. You may, yeah, that's right. It's just that we don't understand the punchline. Um, but they certainly roll, they certainly roll up in a ball. Yeah, I wonder what their equivalent of Irish <laughs> is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, cool, it, it creased me up that, that would louse joke. Okay, so. Um, yeah. Um, okay. That, so I think that's. <laughs> so I'm going to put some stuff on the show notes, Oliver, for your podcast. Oh, right. Good. Show I, I really should do that for my podcast. It sounds it sounds like these things you should do. Yeah. I don't know. Is it, well, you know, it's just because I, I I'm always I always intrigued by, um, you know, I, I like to sort of explore what people are doing um you know in their sort of creative stuff and I, you know, maybe i'm assuming that other people should but um, i'll put some stuff in the show notes but have you got any other any other sort of thoughts about because what you're doing i think is really interesting you know that you, you've had you okay you always had a a job as you said but you certainly had this other other life mm. which is still there but it's just mm. you're not doing the evening gigs and all the rest of it. And I find I find that I find that really interesting. The people who got got a skill like that, but they don't do the conventional way of okay, you know, be a stand-up comedian. But that you've you've moved that into some other area. Mm. Um, and I always find that interesting. The people who have. You know, I've, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who are musicians who then stop being musician, yeah. do something else, and sometimes come back to it again. Mm. Um, and I'm I'm interested in that as well. You know, oh, I mean, it's very easy for me. It's abject cowardice um, and, and indolence. So I, I, I thought sometimes I thought, oh, I'm good enough to make it. Uh, but then, like, I look at Harry Hill with his ambition and his and his dedication and obviously his talent as well. He was great comic. Um, his, his early stand-up, I prefer to his later TV stuff, where he's more um, cabaret. But his, his early stand-up was really well-observed and clever. He was different. Um, in, not to diminish any of his later works, but uh, no, I was just a coward. I, I knew that I would earn more, uh, my, my, earning, my earnings would be more stable if I stayed at the day job, which I didn't hate. In fact, I quite liked it. Um, yes. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to churn out um, material day after day because I just spend the time watching neighbours and I knew that I'd probably drink too much um, if, uh, and enjoy myself too much and uh, 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 it was the easy option. Also I wanted to be a dad as well 
and I wanted to do Home Nights uh, for Charlie, whom you know, uh, and later, later Anna. So it, it, it wasn't an option and it wasn't, I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I gave up. I was quite relieved that I gave up. I remember there was one year that I did about maybe 100, 150 gigs as well as a 95 job, as well as an Edinburgh show. And I was really knackered at the end of that. I really yeah. suffered after that. I can remember now how exhausted I was. And I, you, you, you couldn't do that. And I got all the joy out of it I wanted to. Um, so, um, but the coming back thing is quite interesting when you say that a lot of the old musicians come back. Um, it's a little bit like, I imagine, uh, as you know, I'm a very, very, very limited musician, both in my guitar and in my vocals. And yet I get enormous pleasure from it because I just tootle around in my room. And I imagine some decent musicians do exactly the same. You can, you can now with all the technology, you can later yeah. track yourself. Yes, of course you can. And that must be fantastic. And a lot of my uh, friends, um, um, Ashley, who came, uh, yeah, laughed yeah. at Blue Scum, does that. And he just downloads a track and you just go, actually, this sounds like uh, this sounds like um, Avicii. He says, mate, have you done this? Who's that vocalist? And he's going, it's me. Jesus. Um, so I can see that. But coming back is an interesting one. I, I do have this fantasy of, of coming back to an excruciatingly small fanfare uh, as a sort of old geezer. Uh, 20 years on from giving up uh, and just see how it goes. Uh, and the great thing about it is if it's a catastrophe, I don't mind it's a story. And if it's good, it's just like, oh, I've got an edge now because there were so many, you know, skinny as I was then, white boys, um, tended to be middle class, but not always, you know, doing comedy. Now being an old, old geezer, I have made more of an edge. I mentioned this to Dave, the promoter I, I talked about earlier, and he said, you'd be surprised. There are quite a few like you now. So there are quite a few comedians... I can think of a few that are still around uh, from when I started who haven't made it, made it, but have made a living out of it. And so they've, they've kept going. And I see them on bills all the time. Paul Tompkinson, for example, Mark May is another one. Um, uh, I still see their names on the comedy store. So I think, oh, you've, 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 you've kept at it. So maybe I wouldn't be as much of a um, novelty act as I, as I thought it would be. But I think, you know, hearing you say that makes me, makes me pushes me even further, actually. Uh, because yeah. once you're up there with that microphone, you're getting a bit of a laugh and stuff. And you're in yeah. the zone, as we talked about before. Yeah. You're not performing now. I'm just like I'm standing in the pub with my friends, just having a bit of chit chat. It's a wonderful feeling. Even those glimpses at Blues Camp that I sometimes get, it's just like, oh, yeah, no, this is fun. This is fun. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. You better remember you've got a band behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. That's fantastic, Oliver. Thanks ever so much, mate. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Real pleasure. No, pleasure for me, actually. Good, good. Glad. Well, you know, it was for me, and it was uh, a lot easier than what I'm used to on these things. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> You'll have to send us a wine list, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. I'll speak to you soon, mate. Sounds good. Bye. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.